Good afternoon, everyone, and still morning in, in some parts of the world. Uh, so uh, it, is, uh, it is my pleasure to, to introduce our first speaker, who is the keynote speaker of the day, uh, Professor Edwilson Motter from uh, Northwestern University. And it, it, it's funny, uh, actually, I, I uh, you know, he just occurred to me, you know, he came to my mind that in the previous session, uh, which I was part of, there were, there were a, a number of talks which were dealing with predictions, forecasting in various settings, one in, for nonlinear settings, chaotic systems, and I had a, a, a talk in um, stochastic forecasting in uh, certain uh, cryptocurrency uh, financial time series, and, and there were some question and discussion which followed where it was clear that it can be highly beneficial when, when, when someone knows a bit more of both of these nonlinear systems, predictions there and, uh, and stochastic systems. And you know, Edison would have been a perfect example who is really among, among those who has considerable experience and background in both of those subfields. So, uh, so it, is, uh, it is my pleasure to welcome him now. And, and, and today he's gonna talk about something you know, quite new, uh, a different aspect of phase transitions and symmetry breaking, the so-called converse symmetry breaking in, uh, in, the concept of, in the context of network. So with that, I pass the mic and the, and the camera to him and, uh, and uh, let's listen to his presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Georgie. Uh, hello everyone. I hope you all can see my, my slides. Can you, Georgie? Yes, I do, yes, full screen, yes. Perfect. So the material present today is uh, different. And um, it is the result of a, of a number of publications with many collaborators. I hope to uh, get to introduce them as I go through my talk. Uh, this was funded over the years by various organizations that are listed here. And because this is perhaps something uh, new to many people, I want to start from a very uh, simple example. Uh, suppose that you have a door and you want that door to close smoothly. You want the door not to slam, not to take too long to close. Well, normally what we do is we put on a device, something like this. It is, uh, it's called a door closer, which effectively damps the door. And the the physics of this device is well understood. You can understand it by just considering a damped oscillator. Um, what you have here is that if you do not damp enough, the uh, looking at the solution of a damped oscillator, you see that there will be oscillations for a long time. That means the door would uh, either slam or would um, keep oscillating depending on the design of the door. Uh, on the other hand, if you damp too much it would take too long for the door to close, which is also not good. There is a certain amount of damping that is just right. That's the critical damping. And the door closes the fastest without slamming. Now, this is going to be so important for the discussion we have here that I will even go through the, the math. It's very simple. This is physics 101. But I want to point to a few things that we don't usually pay attention to. So second Newton's law gives you this simple equation for the damped harmonic oscillator. And the object of interest for us here is this parameter B, which is proportional to the damping coefficient. Now, if you propose a solution like this, we'll find that it indeed solves the problem. It's a solution to that equation. But there are two qualitatively different types of solutions. Uh, one of them for when gamma is a real number, and the other when gamma is complex. So when it's complex, you have the oscillations I mentioned earlier. Now, what separates those two uh, regimes is precisely the value of the parameter B. So when B is equal to BC, where BC is a function of the mass and the 
uh, mass uh, and the spring constant, then you have the critical damping, okay? If it is smaller, it's underdamped. If it is larger, it's overdamped, okay? Now, one thing to note, this does not depend on the initial conditions. It depends on the other parameters. And I want you to, by the way, for later reference to, to perhaps even memorize that when the mass and the spring constant are unity, and they both are equal to one, the, this critical parameters, the parameter is two, okay? Just two. Uh, now, it does not depend on the initial condition, okay? Any initial condition will lead to the same conclusion. Okay, and uh, the other thing too <laughs> is elementary, but I will I will mention anyway, is that if you want to damp something well, we just we don't just arbitrarily increase damping. Okay, in particular, if damping is infinite, the door will never close, so that's not good. So there is indeed a finite optimal solution. Okay, so with those things in mind. Then now, this uh, happens with okay. uh, Instead of one, let's we consider a problem now. If I want all the doors to close uh, up, uh, you might think, well, solution to one is the solution to any, and therefore to many. I would just uh, do the same that I would have done otherwise to each of them. And um, well, that's not uh, a solution because these are not ordinary doors. Uh, we are network scientists. So we want the doors to be coupled to each other. And as soon as we put coupling, coupling between the doors, the solution changes. And then you may think, okay, no problem. I will adjust the, the damping. And uh, I will do that for one door and I will implement the same solution to all the others to correct for the, for the coupling. And I say, that's not going to be an optimal solution. What you end up with is not going to be analogous to the critical damping that we were talking about uh, so far. Even if the doors are identically coupled to each other, even if they are coupled through a ring, okay? And the reason is, very simple. I will illustrate this with what I believe to be the simplest possible uh, model. Okay? It's really a minimal model of only two springs. So you have here three particles, and these particles are connected through springs. The particles are identical, the springs are identical, and in this case, just to keep things simple, I assume that the masses are unity, the spring constants are also equal to one. And these masses are constrained to move on the horizontal only, okay? So they are not subject to any force other than the springs themselves. Uh, so this system is damped, okay? And there are now three damping parameters, one for each particle, B1, B2, B3. I can look for the optimal assignment of those parameters so that when I perturb this system, it will go back to the rest position as quickly as possible. And like in the case we were studying earlier, we find those three possibilities. There is a well-defined, an ambiguously well-defined optimal. And if you uh, increase the damping, in this case by a factor of five, you go to an overdamped regime. If you decrease, you go to an underdamped regime. The only uh, technical difference is that because we have three particles here, it's difficult to plot the variables of the individual particles. So the closest quantity that still represents the position of the particles is the potential energy. So that's what we are plotting here. And it's always non-negative. But as a function of time, you can see that it's very similar to what we would have expected, right? Now, just to be clear, the equations of motion are what I suggest they would be. The, Three particles are identical. They are coupled in a symmetric way. And uh, it's convenient to use uh, uh, the coordinates uh, that measure their displacement from the rest position. So that's why we are measuring 
x1, x2, and x3 uh, in this way. Now, there is a symmetry here in this system. Particles one and three, they have, they have the exact same status. They are identical from the network perspective, the way they are coupled to each other okay? in this uh, mass spring network. Uh, particle two is different as a preferred position because coupled to two of them, but that's not the point. The point is one and three, and we want to pay attention to one and three. And here is the first punchline. The optimal assignment of parameters is not one in which B1 is equal to B3. In fact, it's very different. This is the optimal. B1 is 2.5 and B3 is 1.5. So this should surprise you if you have not thought about this problem before. Because intuitively you could think that, well, since these guys are identically coupled to the network, their optimal assignment of parameters, so the entire system gets to rest gets to the rest position the fastest uh, would intuitively perhaps be the same. It's not. In case you are curious, by the way, the middle one is 3.2 in this optimal sign. Now let's compare these numbers with what we would have for a single spring. It would be two, I said earlier, huh? based on our trip. So that's really the average between those two guys. Okay, That's not the average over the, all three of them. And of course, because of symmetry, another equally good solution, equivalent to this one, is the one in which these two guys are swapped, in which uh, B1 is equal to 1.5 and B3 is equal to 2.5. Okay, that's a solution too. And it's optimal. Okay, now just to uh, perhaps uh, intrigue you more. Uh, as much as these parameters do not depend on initial conditions, for this particular simulation, we use the symmetric initial conditions too, so that we avoid any possible question about that. So the initial conditions are given here. Uh, I'm effectively uh, uh, squeezing the system uh, symmetrically and then releasing it. Okay, so the initial velocity is zero, and the, the particles are. are are the external particles are displaced by one unit of distance. The middle one remains in the same position. Okay. Now, I want you to think, I'll not tell you what happens, but I want you to think what happens to the middle part when you have uh, an initial condition like that. And uh, again, the uh, assignment of parameters that would optimize this are the same regardless of whether the initial condition is this or anything else. But um, this is especially interesting to reflect on because for the same system, if I hold with my finger the middle particle at rest, okay, and I only play with the other two, as soon as I do that, well, B2 then becomes undefined because it becomes infinite effectively, but it's no longer a parameter that's used. But B1 and B3, they immediately become equal to two as soon as I hold the middle particle, okay? So that's how I decouple these two particles, okay? I decouple these two particles by holding the middle one, okay? And when I hold the middle one, the other two will have an optimal damping equal to two. Now, the initial condition I chose, and that's what I want you to think about, is such that the middle particle did not move. I just released the other two particles from a symmetric position, okay? So you might want to think then about what is going on here. And I might revisit this later if you want, but um, there is something very interesting that underlies the effect that I am describing in this particular system. Now, the broader questions though are, uh, how this would happen, right? And perhaps not just in this system, but in case it's more general, and I tell you it is very general, how this would happen in general, and what this is useful for, right? Uh, this, I'm not presenting this just because it is a, a curious system. This is actually of uh, practical significance. So the way to understand how this comes about is by recognizing that this can be traced back to this new concept of 
converse symmetry breaking, which is in the title of my talk. And to understand converse symmetry breaking, uh, I want to first comment on symmetry breaking itself. So symmetry breaking, which I suppose you all are familiar with, is a scenario in which you have a system with a certain symmetry. Maybe the system has rotational symmetry. And the stable solutions of the system do not exhibit that symmetry. Okay? And when we are talking about classical systems, we usually spell it out just like that. Uh, a simple example of this would be the case of uh, Mexican head potential. Even in one dimension, you can have a symmetric system, in that case with uh, mirror symmetry, in which the symmetric position is unstable. And the, if you put a particle in a potential with that shape, the, with small dissipation, the particle will end up in one of the two stable uh, fixed points that are not at the symmetric position. So you have two solutions in that case, and none of them that are stable, none of them exhibit the symmetry of the system. And um, so this really illustrates the first point about symmetry break, which is all about stability, okay? It's all about stability, and I will revisit that in my last slide. Uh, if you are studying quantum systems, then usually you make the statement uh, with respect to the ground state. It's the state that's most relevant for this statement to be made. And there are technical reasons for doing that, uh, including that you have to be careful uh, if you are talking about states that uh, involve a superposition of uh, of uh, different uh, eigenstates of the Hamilton, because then you could have a trivial solution breaking the symmetry. Uh, so with this in mind, converse symmetry breaking is a situation in which not only that happens, but you can stabilize a solution with the symmetry that you care about precisely by breaking that one symmetry in the system. By the way, it's important to know that I'm talking about the same symmetry. So let's just stick to say rotational symmetry. You have a system with rotational symmetry. There is no stable solution with rotational symmetry. And then I say, there are systems with that, that exhibit that property for which the stable solutions can be made, turned into rotationally symmetric solutions if and only if I break the rotational symmetry of the system itself. So the equations of motion of the system will no longer exhibit rotational symmetry. And here I want to also be clear about what I mean by solution, what I mean by system. Uh, sometimes I refer to solution or state, which is really the dynamical behavior of the system. Okay? And the system uh, can be equated to the set of uh, equations that describe this system, okay? So the symmetry is, for the system is really at that level, okay? So this is the situation we are indirectly finding when we are studying this, 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 this door closing example I was discussing. Uh, in that case, the breaking of the symmetry was required uh, not to stabilize, but to improve stability. Uh, and, and I it's natural to frame that problem in that way. But once you have that system exhibiting that property, it's very easy to modify this system by adding extra terms so that you destabilize this symmetric configuration of the system and you are really required to break the symmetry to stabilize. Okay. So we are effectively finding an example of a converse symmetry breaking through that example that I was discussing a moment ago. This was first notes in a paper that I published with Takashi Nishikawa in 2016. I want to be very brief about this uh, work because I have mentioned this in some of my previous presentations and I know that some in the audience have seen it. But for uh, pedagogical reasons, I find this example to be uh, very good. So in that case, we studied the, the situation in which we had uh, oscillators that were identically coupled to each other. We intentionally coupled them in a way that all oscillators in the network had a, an identical structural position. So when we had three oscillators, for example, we coupled them in a triangle like this with rotational symmetry. So the coupling was, uh, was, was such that if you rotated the system, everything would remain the same. 
So you'll not be able to distinguish these oscillators on the basis of uh, the position they occupy in the network. Each oscillator was defined to be a phase amplitude oscillator. So they have uh, two variables, one representing the angular variable and the other representing the amplitude. And uh, the equations described the system are shown here. They have some parameters that you don't need to worry about. They are all assigned to be the same for all oscillators. And there is one, of, one parameter only that we will consider both for when it is the same for our oscillators and when it is not, this parameter bi here. And uh, in this system, if the parameters are all the same, including bi, then you really cannot distinguish the different oscillators because you cannot distinguish them on the basis of their structural properties, the way they are coupled to the network, and you cannot distinguish them on the basis of their own identity because they are all identical, okay? And that's the case that's most commonly studied in, uh, in, the, in the area of synchronization is when they are identical or, or when they are small perturbations of being identical. Uh, so, but here uh, we want to test the hypothesis that uh, you, you, we could have a converse symmetry breaking in this system. And uh, to do that, we look for optimal assignments of this parameter that stabilize the synchronous state for the system uh, under both, both under the constraint uh, that the oscillators are identical, meaning that this will be the same for all three oscillators and when they are not. And here is uh, 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 something that's very common to many uh, oscillator models. These oscillators are diffusively coupled in the sense that uh, when the variables of the different oscillators equal each other, the coupling terms vanish. That means that a solution for the isolated system is also a solution for the coupled system. And the isolated system in this case has a limit cycle solution uh, uh, corresponding to R equal to one in which the oscillators are moving around at constant speed. That limit cycle solution remains a solution when you couple the oscillators like this. The question is only whether it is stable or not. So that's the solution that we are studying. And we want to study stability of that solution as a function of the assignment of parameters bi. Now, again, this is a case in which we can really talk about complete synchronization. You have uh, two variables for each oscillator, and we want both of them to be identical for all oscillators, okay? And yet, when we assign the parameters under those two different constraints, when we constrain them to be identical, we of course find identical parameters for all oscillators. And this is the best possible assignment in terms of stabilizing that state. Uh, if we allow them to be non-identical, the optimal is no longer that one, it's different and uh, uh, of course, different for each oscillator. So the fact that the optimal when we release that constraint is different is already a surprise in a sense of the same type of the surprise we had when we were studying those three masses coupled to strings earlier. It shows that the identical was not an optimal assignment. And in this case, actually the identical doesn't even stabilize the system. If you start initial conditions close to the synchronous state, you will see this different behavior in red, is the identical case. The, the trajectories for the three oscillators diverge very quickly as a function of time. And in blue is for the non-identical parameter assignment and they converge to synchronous state, okay? So this is an example. Of course, we studied this in a more systematic way and we have a, a more complete characterization of this system, which I don't want to go over here. But this is an example of uh, a converse symmetry breaking in a system that we can study uh, uh, mathematically, we can understand it uh, very well. And I want just to point out one more thing about this system. Here's the term in which that parameter that's set to be different for the different oscillators is appearing. In this particular example, this term here vanishes when the system synchronizes. So the initial solution that we had, the limit cycle solution remains unaltered when we change beta i, even if we set it to be different for different gender uh, os uh, oscillators. And that's, uh, that, that, that's, that's an interesting thing about this one system. 
Uh, so really the impact of setting the parameters uh, non-identical is at the level of the variational equation. So the variational equation, which picks the derivatives of this term, do not vanish, okay? So these guys appear in the variational equation, but not in the, in the dynamical equation of, uh, of, of the oscillators themselves. This is a particularity of, uh, of this system, is not the case of many other systems we studied that exhibit over symmetry breaking, but it's a, it's a, it's a good, uh, good property here, I say, because it helps us really uh, separate the effect of things and see where they appear. It's intentional that we couple those oscillators identically, but the effects they hold in general, they appear, for example, in systems with uh, uh, random network topologies. So here's a, some small examples with five oscillators. And uh, in general, for, 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 for those oscillators I was describing, we have the situation in which the stability is improved when I allow the oscillators to be non-identical. So what's being shown here is the maximum transverse depth of exponent to the synchronous state, which is the measure of synchronization of stability. This quantity should be negative for the synchronous state to be stable. And we are plotting it as a function of the, uh, basically as a function of uh, the distance from the best identical parameter assignment which would be here. So there is a further improvement as you go farther away from there. And there is a region where it becomes negative, okay? Which is not possible if we limit them to be identical to each other, okay? In fact, if we allow the networks to be uh, general, not to be symmetric networks only as in the previous example, uh, this effect is even more prevalent, okay? The, the, it's only then that uh, one thing that you have to to keep in mind is that then you have two forms of the heterogeneity, right? You have the heterogeneity in the oscillators that I'm talking about, and also uh, in the network structure. Both interesting, but the most counterintuitive aspect of the problem is really at the oscillators here. So uh, this, uh, this is uh, one example of one system that was studied in one of our previous papers, the first one, but I want to point out that there is now uh, a number of other uh, systems studied exhibiting many different aspects of this, of this phenomenon. And I'm listing here uh, the publications from our group also as a way to introduce my collaborators. So this always started, as I mentioned, early 2016. I was back then, uh, well, actually it was in the fall of 2015 that we, we, we recognized this effect. I was, uh, uh, I was on a sabbatical leave in, in Italy. I was in Rome. Takashi was in the United States. And we, uh, it all started almost from a typo uh, when we were communicating by email. And uh, we, we then recognized that there was something more than a misunderstanding in our communication. And, uh, and, and we followed up. And uh, that's how we formalized this concept. Uh, then my student, Young Zhao, he was uh, still starting his PhD, he defended last month. He picked up on that and really developed this, uh, first by studying a class of networks that are uh, really uh, multiplex networks of oscillators, even though that's not uh, uh, explicitly indicated in the title, that's, that's how you could recognize the networks he studied. And he demonstrated that it's, it's, it's very common in that type of, uh, oscillator network to, to, to find this behavior I was describing here. He later developed methods to identify uh, systems that can exhibit identical synchronization when the oscillators are non-identical, uh, especially systems with time delay in the couplings. And those systems can uh, uh, very often lead to a, a number of possibilities that was not previously recognized for the lack of uh, mathematical methods to study them. Okay? So that was something that was included in the, this publication. I discussed this in broad terms in, a, in a, an overview paper that I wrote with my team two years ago. And, uh, but then others uh, in our group followed up on, on, on these studies, uh, in particular, Zach Nicolau and, and Dennis, they wrote a very nice paper introducing a new class of oscillator called, called Janus oscillators that are very uh, 
uh, interesting because they exhibit uh, all sorts of behaviors that uh, we had previously to look for in different classes of oscillators, including chimera states, explosive uh, uh, synchronization, multistability of all sorts, and yes, converse symmetry breaking as well. Um, so most of this work was done at the oscillator level, but as I said earlier, uh, you can translate some of this to the network topology as well. You could assign the oscillators to be identical and make the, the couplings between oscillators non-identical. And that's especially interesting in the context of uh, cluster synchronization because the clusters are usually defined as symmetry clusters. The candidate clusters for synchronization are symmetry clusters. And we discovered that we could break the symmetry of those clusters uh, we could improve synchronization, improve uh, stability, and, and stabilize clusters that would otherwise not stabilize by breaking the symmetry, the internal symmetry of those clusters. It, it applies in particular in the case of global synchronization if you want to consider the entire network as a single cluster. Okay? So this was the first paper in which we also had experiments, and it was done in collaboration with the Maryland group, and uh, Joy Hart and Raj Roy, and they... Uh, they, 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 they really came up with a very beautiful exam, uh, experiment uh, that helped demonstrate this effect. Um, we had also our own experiment being run in, 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 in the background, so to say, for a number of, uh, of years. Uh, it was an, an, a very involved experiment. It was led by uh, Ferenc Molnar. He was a postdoc in our group at the time. He later moved to the group of Sotan Trotsky and recently to, the, to a very interesting job in the industry. But um, uh, Ferenc, uh, who is not too far from, from Transylvania, by the way, uh, originally, he, uh, he's a theorist with uh, good experimental skills. So he was able to put together an experiment I will comment on in a moment. And I will also comment on uh, uh, another uh, work, the third one, to involve experiments very briefly, even though I only comment on the theory part, that was done in collaboration with the group of uh, uh, Istvan Keys uh, in St. Louis. Uh, the work I was talking about uh, uh, in the introduction of, uh, of this talk is the introduction of this paper that's not yet published with both uh, Ferenc and uh, Takashi. So this talk will be really about, uh, or has been really about uh, a small portion of these three publications. So very, very recent work um, and um, work that has, it was either published this year or is, is, is supposed to be published uh, relatively soon. So I'm resisting the temptation of talking about older work because I assume that many people have already seen some of that. Now, this paper in Nature Physics, I should mention, appeared in the archive today. So if you had problems to uh, uh, get access to the paper in the magazine, it's now freely available online. Okay, so... Uh, the example that I want to use uh, to justify, uh, I could use many, but uh, this is a particularly convenient one, to justify the usefulness of studying this, 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 this phenomenon is the case of power grid networks. Uh, power grid networks have a number of uh, 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 interesting dynamical um, behaviors uh, that are studied by network scientists, including cascading failures and, and, and uh, other stability and instability related issues. But in connection with this presentation, what is of uh, special interest is the fact that the power generators have to be synchronized, frequent synchronized in an, in an AC power grid network. So in the case of the United States, for example, the entire network is divided into three main interconnections. And each one of those interconnections is uh, an AC network. So the generators in each one of those three interconnections have to be synchronized with each other. They may have different phases, but the frequencies should be the same and should be approximately 60 Hertz in the case of the United States. Now, the equation that describes the dynamics follows from the second Newton's law and has this form. 
Uh, the right side theorem here is the coupling between the generators. So this equation is describing really the angles be, uh, of, of the individual generators in this grid. And I, I don't want to get into the details of how this coupling theorem comes about. I will actually, uh, I will refer to, to, to this uh, paper where Takashi and I describe uh, the various synchronization models used in the literature and how they relate to each other, how you get to them from a master model by uh, recognizing different assumptions that underlie each one of those. What I want you to notice is that this equation is exactly the same equation of the closing door that I was talking about earlier, the, the damped harmonic oscillator that I was using. And the damping is really this term here, okay? So uh, despite the many other uh, uh, non-trivial things that underlie the derivation of this equation and the coupling term is an important thing not to be neglected, the core part of the equation is the same. So the problem of uh, stabilizing this system optimally is again the problem of finding an optimal assignment of, of damping, par damping parameters. And these parameters, uh, if the system was uncoupled, it would be trivial to find, but because it is coupled, uh, lead to new phenomena, okay? I want to first show that this system exhibits converse symmetry breaking in the strongest sense. And to see that, let's consider a very small toy network with only four power generators. And uh, I am representing it here in, uh, in, in what we call a uh, structurally reduced form, where the, the loads in the network have been uh, replaced by equivalent, equivalent impedances. So we only have generators, really. Everything else has been uh, eliminated. And the generators are coupled to each other. Uh, the one interesting thing that uh, we did on purpose here was to design this network so that two generators are symmetrically coupled to the network. So B, uh, generators two and three are symmetrically coupled. And um, so they are structurally identical. You will not be able to distinguish them, okay? And uh, all the generators are identified by a single parameter that is this guy here. And let's assume that we already assigned the values to those, doesn't matter, okay? So for those uh, conditions, if you try to optimize these guys here, you can plot that, uh, uh, the, the solution in a two-dimensional space, you will find that it will look like this. So this really is the maximum transverse Lyapunov exponent to the phase synchronized state. And you see that the uh, best assignment of parameters is not the one in which they are identical to each other, is uh, one in which they are different. And again, there are two symmetric solutions, right? Because the symmetry of the system always leads to having uh, a solution in which the value of this can be swapped with the value of that. But uh, uh, this is interesting, okay? So this system indeed exhibits the phenomenon that I was talking about earlier. And uh, even though this is, uh, you might say, a uh, uh, cherry-picked example uh, on purpose to, uh, it, to isolate the effect, uh, it also shows that this effect remains even when we eliminate all the other uh, heterogeneities in the system, okay? Now, in dealing with real systems, we do not need to uh, uh, eliminate the other heterogeneities, so we can account for them, and that's precisely what we have been doing. Uh, so here are two examples of uh, real power grid networks. You should be able to recognize this as the map of Germany. Uh, this part here in the, is in the northeastern United States, southern Canada uh, area. Both of these networks are uh, represented in, a, in, a, in an aggregated form where Sometimes power generators that are co-localized co are lumped together. That does not change the conclusions. Uh, and what you, I want you to note here is, well, the size of the generators is, uh, uh, the size of the dots is representing the amount of power generated by these different guys. This is just to give you a sense that they are all large and uh, uh, comparable in some sense. Um, 
the color is the object of study. The color is indicating the value of the damping, the damping parameter for each oscillator generator. And the colors are assigned here for the global optimum, okay? The global optimum assignment. And um, for the global optimum assignment, the Lyapunov exponent is uh, very, uh, very small, okay? In both cases. If we constrain the, the, the generators to be, uh, to have identical damping, then it becomes, uh, it's still negative, but less, that's small. And uh, this matters for three different reasons. Uh, first, in the real system, this simulation here has been shown for the, the, the deterministic uh, uh, limit. But in the real system, uh, in addition to this determinist, deterministic equation, you have uh, also stochastic factors that have to be accounted for. And uh, that is fluctuations in power demand and generation, and uh, including especially now uh, due to generation from intermittent sources. And uh, also you have that this stability margin here depends on the overall level of power demand. If I increase the power demand, this, this, this number shift up and it can get to the point where this becomes negative just through demand stress. And the other thing is uh, just uncertainty, right? Um, which is due to different conditions because during the day, during the week, during the year, the conditions change and these numbers will change as a consequence of that and uncertainty also on the modeling. So you do really want this number to be as small as possible. And there are many scenarios under which the, the top number here would not be sufficiently small to give you stability, okay? And even if thus, it could lead to long oscillations, which is undesirable. So this is a very concrete example. In both systems, we see very clearly that the, uh, the assignment that's optimal is very heterogeneous. That should be obvious by naked eye. Here is the color bar in each case, okay? By the way, that arrow is marking the average that you'd have for, for the uh, optimal assignment. And you, you see that um, in this case, uh, you, you can make the argument that part of the heterogeneity is coming from the fact that the network itself is heterogeneous. And that is true. But even if you were to eliminate all the heterogeneity and the line network, you still have converse symmetry breaking coming into play. This is very different from what we knew before for such systems. Uh, this is uh, the previous optimal solution which was in a publication was part of. And this paper considered the, the, specifically the case in which we, we assumed the, 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 the generators to have equal damping. And we asked the question, what was the optimal assignment? And you can express the optimal in terms of the eigenvalue of a coupling matrix, which is clear and well-defined, is a very sharp optimal. So there's no ambiguity as to what that optimum is. It's unique and well-defined. But as, again, as soon as you uh, lift the constraint of them being identical, you have, uh, you have uh, much more interesting thing to look at. So here is, for the case of three generators, a uh, very simple system that is uh, often used as a test system with three generators. So we have beta one, beta two, beta three, and to reduce to two, dim to a two dimensional plot, we plotted beta two and beta, the beta two, beta three plane that cuts across the two optimal points, the one under the constraint of them being identical and the global one. And the global one is better than the, 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 the one they are constrained to be identical, <laughs> is distinctively better. And it's interesting also that this uh, uh, landscape has a structure in which there is a, a, a a line that connects the two is a strictly decreasing curve in terms of uh, the Lyapunov exponent, okay? We always use the Lyapunov exponent for this type of analysis because it really conveys the transverse stability to the synchronous state, okay? Now, I want to use this figure to also point to something that is uh, uh, perhaps not appreciated. 
uh, the problem here is ultimately reduced to the to a spectral problem. We are studying eigenvalues, and um, we are studying optimal eigenvalues in a sense. And in that space, things tend to be very um, uh, unsmooth. It's very difficult to run optimization in a space like that. For uh, three, four generators, we can uh, use uh, efficient methods, sometimes even exhaustive optimization methods to find the global optimum. As soon as we go to higher dimensional systems, uh, this problem quickly becomes uh, untreatable by uh, deterministic methods. You have to use meta-heuristic ones. And those methods tend to uh, underestimate the, the global optimum because the system is very structured. It has very small local uh, 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 valleys and you can get stuck in those places very easily even with the best methods, okay? So part of the activity in our group is on developing methods to find these this, this points in the first place. So I would say, I would speculate that part of the reason why uh, this important thing has not been uh, studied before is on the one hand, there was no mathematical methods available to study non-identical, uh, this identical synchronization of non-identical systems and compared to study stability of those. And on the other hand, uh, numerical methods to try to, to find this uh, in, in an exploratory, exploratory way uh, are also very limited and um, uh, they are not uh, of um, the practical use at this point. So we had to go great lengths, for example, to generate the numerics for the uh, two power degrees that I presented in the previous slide. I want to now give you two final examples, but before I do that, maybe I could consult you, George, in terms of how, how well we are doing with time. You have five minutes left. I was just about to point it out, five minutes. Wonderful. So this is the, uh, this is the experiment that Ferenc Molnar put together. Three power generators, and most of the effort in the experiment was to try to make sure that we we had really identical generators and that they were identically coupled. So you have a motor that is uh, powering a generator and you have um, a mechanical brakes to implement the damping, okay? And you measure then the speed of this thing uh, for each one of the cases and you compare the cases in which the damping is equal or different. And what we found from running this experiment which is now under much more realistic conditions than any of the simulations I presented you before, because now we have uh, noise, we have uh, all sorts of uh, 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 effects that would be neglected in a, in, a, in a model. So by running this multiple times, we could generate statistics about uh, comparing the homogeneous optimum with the heterogeneous optimum. And when this difference is positive, means that making the uh, damping different is beneficial. And in most cases, it was really positive. So this was uh, a, direct, uh, a direct confirmation of this effect. Uh, now, just a final comment uh, to bring this to the context of uh, stochastic systems. A uh, paper that was published just weeks ago with uh, Istvan Kiss group <clears throat> was uh, designed, really the project here was designed to address the issue of, of noise in, in, in coupled systems. Uh, you might know from the old literature in, on uh, noise induced synchronization that sometimes people uh, are able to show that oscillators synchronize when subject to external noise, even when they are not coupled to each other, just because the noise itself is providing order to the system. And that happens as long as the noise is the same that for, for, for both oscillators, right? For, for all the oscillators. So if you have two oscillators, you want both of them to be subject to the same noise or to correlate the noise in order to synchronize if they are not coupled. Now we, which we, most of these studies were for uncoupled oscillators, some, some were also for 
couple of months, right, in the past. But we want to focus on the case in which this does not lead to synchronization, not uh, to satisfactory synchronization. So we want to focus on the case in which you have coupled systems that do not synchronize, and that do not synchronize well even when you introduce common noise, okay, even when you are driving the, the, the different oscillators with the same noise. And our, uh, our point was to show that such systems can be synchronized if you drive them with uncorrelated noise, if the noise driving this guy is uncorrelated with the noise driving this guy, okay? This is very different from the previous observations of noise-induced synchronization, okay? And uh, I want to emphasize the importance of these guys being coupled. Okay, this does not happen if they are not coupled to each other. If they are not coupled to each other, the oscillator will become you know, more uncorrelated. But if they are coupled, the interplay between the noise and the coupling can give rise to this effect. And I think you will recognize already up front that this has something in common with the previous part of my presentation, because here too you are somehow breaking asymmetry now through the external driving in order to uh, increase the coherence in the system. Uh, this paper was uh, a theory and experience, but I want to give just one very simple example, which was theoretical for the system that you all know. Kuramoto system with, uh, uh, with, uh, with noise. And I want to consider the case of just two oscillators, the frequency difference delta omega, and I'll actually focus on the case in which the coupling is strictly additive. So G equal to one. When G is equal to one, common noise doesn't have an effect. That can be shown even analytically. So if you plot the uh, order parameter, in this case is time, time average order parameter, as a function of the normalized noise intensity, you don't see anything happening as a function of common noise intensity, but for uncorrelated noise, you have improvement of uh, synchronization by this measure for some intermediate level of noise, okay? In this example, we are slightly below the synchronization transition for the deterministic version of the system, okay? So the copy- And so you have, you have one minute. Just okay, so this is really the last slide. So uh, it's good that you say that. I'm stopping here. And I uh, will switch just to this final remarks, which I can comment on uh, more if people have questions. I want to just point to one thing that is often comes up. People ask whether the things I was presented here, presenting here have, are compatible with the Curie's principle. And they say they are for two reasons. The Curie principle, by the way, is the statement that symmetries of the causes must be found in the effects. So it speaks more about symmetry breaking than converse symmetry breaking. But uh, in addition, even in the context of symmetry breaking, uh, the Curie's principle is about exact symmetries and symmetry breaking as well as converse symmetry breaking is about stability. So that's the key difference. Uh, more information can be found in our web page. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eliozon. Thank you very much for the very nice presentation. Okay, let me see if there are any questions. Okay, so Edison, can, can you can you read the chat and, and, and read the question? That, probably that would be better if I as if I read it out. Um, maybe Lost you could class. read while I look for it. Okay, so uh, say you find the values of damping parameters beta one, beta n, etc where the system has the lowest Lyapunov exponent in the non-chaotic region. Is it possible to do that analytically for a large system or network, including a large number of coupled oscillators? So, Yeah, analytically is, uh, is, uh, is, is, is a tricky question in general, even for um, Identical oscillators, you can't always do that, right? We can come up with conditions analytically. We can come up with analytical conditions. And here too, in the paper that we published in 2018 in nonlinearity, we, we could write analytical conditions 
for this to happen. So those conditions are written in terms of, uh, of the vector field for the, uh, for the solutions of interest to exist. And they were written in terms of, uh, of uh, essentially the Aponov exponents for the, um, for the stability of those states be the way we want. But it is, uh, for the most part, unavoidable that that part of this then has to be completed with numerics to verify the conditions okay, for systems that are uh, of common interest, such as uh, phase oscillators, phase amplitude oscillators, chaotic oscillators. Okay. But uh, in, the, in a couple of papers, we have been able to go beyond that. And the papers and the, the, the systems for which we could go beyond that were systems in which we were studying um, uh, variants of um, uh, pecora carroll models. Why? Because in those cases, you can reduce the stability in the identical case to the study of uh, eigenval eigenvalues. And we could transport part of that to, to the study of, um, of uh, a, a non-identical oscillators. So that was in particular uh, explored in this paper in 2017 uh, for multi-layer networks. And also in this paper in 2019, uh, we established very uh, explicit analytical condition in terms of the eigenvalues. By the way, that question was from Robert Salazar. I apologize that I forgot to announce where it came from while I was uh, kind of reading it. And okay. just to complete one aspect of the question, this include, this, in both cases, this includes chaotic oscillators. Okay? So it's, it, it doesn't really make a big difference if the oscillators are chaotic or not, because we don't need to make a reference to the dynamics, the local dynamics, okay. just to the structure. Yeah. Uh, anyone else? I do have a question. Actually, one one is more like from the engineering side, and then whatever falls out of that is that when engineers uh, plan, I mean, design and engineer these generators, and and you use the damping individually for all those elements, are those damping uh, coefficients kind of uh, hardwired in the system and 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 cannot change, or or something that they can change in real time along the you know, on the fly? as the whole system is, is, is getting into motion, so to say. For what systems are you-, you the, the power, the, the generators, the power, power grid. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a very good question, right? The power generators have been built and it's not like we can just go there and change them, you might argue. But there are uh, two opportunities for intervention. Uh, in a, aside from the opportunity for better future design of new ones that are coming into, the, into play, uh, which is, uh, in the case of uh, generation from intermittent sources, you have a few handles you can tweak. Um, uh, the, the damping includes uh, inertia, inertia, an inertia component, for example. Uh, and uh, when you have um, a generation from solar and wind, you usually have the ability to introduce virtual inertia that would orient your choices for that. Uh, but uh, closer to the problem of dealing with conventional power generators, you would probably use uh, uh, power system stabilizers, which can be used to effectively change the damping. Okay? So yes, you can do that in principle, and that could be an interesting thing to explore uh, in terms of uh, looking into the practical viability of it. Yeah, okay. I had some follow-up questions, but there are some others appeared here, so I, I rather point to Let those. Let me answer here. this question One. that came from Steve, that is yes, in the chat yes. about so field theories. Them, yes, you can see that, right? Yes, yes, absolutely. So we have many uh, initiatives to explore this on those fronts, and also uh, you <laughs> in PD systems as well. And uh, the, the short answer is yes. Okay. Uh, the, good, the interesting thing about this, this type of phenomenon, as it is, for example, in the case of symmetry breaking, 
is that each, each manifestation comes with its own uh, rich uh, set of implications and, uh, and properties, right? Symmetry breaking is studied in pattern formation, but is also what gives rise to uh, uh, superconductivity in condensed matter physics is what gives rise to the Higgs mechanism in particle physics and so on. So likewise here, it is uh, something that we ultimately have that type of, uh, of, of implication based on what we, we have found so far. We have many unpublished uh, uh, pieces of evidence, with collaborators on these things. And uh, yes, fluids is one of the things we are uh, actively working on, both uh, on theory and experiments with collaborators. Thank you. So we have one more question and, and Zoltan uh, can decide whether to go ahead and answer the questions or, or, or save it for later as we reach the uh, sort of uh, the start of the next presentation. So yeah, uh, not time. Maybe, maybe I put this question in, in a private discussion. OK. Then. OK. Thank you. So very thanks much. again, Edison. It was a very nice Thank you. survey of, uh, of uh, recent research. So with that, we are moving on to our second talk of the of the session. Uh, it's going to be presented by Professor Horacio Wheel from the Institute for Cross Disciplinary Physics and Complex System from I think Palma de Mallorca, Spain. And the title of his talk is "Variation Approach to KPZ: Fluctuation Theorems, Large Deviation Function for Entropy Production and Probability Distribution." Thanks for the possibility of talking to in this conference. What I try to to do very fast is to, to describe the variational approach to KPZ and uh, present fluctuation theorems, large deviation functions, etc. This is what we're known in, somehow in collaboration or discussing with people from Spain and Argentina. Um, well, <clears throat> what uh, we have done is to, to discuss the, the problem the growing of a, of a surface, let's say, when subject to the, um, uh, the particles that decay over read and, and forms a, um, a road surface, uh, originally described by the Edward Wilkinson equation and later in the middle 80s, uh, was corrected or was improved by Carter Barry Zang, including this nonlinear term that uh, describes somehow the um, curvature of the front. Um, for many time, a long time, it was supposed that it was not possible to describe it through a variational formulation like this equation. But in this work, we have shown that it is possible and that such a functional has this form with a very, this very complicated structure of this functional <clears throat> and with this characteristic that uh, attempts to to think of it as a <clears throat> as a Lyapunov functional, but because it is not bounded neither from above nor for below, it's not. But it's just a functional a potential um, panorama in which the system evolves. The the original equation can be the, the form of the functional can be written in this way, in which this term indicates clearly that there is a, a very long memory for the process. Capacity equation has no memory, but this functional keeps the memory of the whole process. And this is in agreement with uh, what a lot of people have been done in the last 10 years or so for the one dimensional system in which using analogies and uh, the diverse methods, they have shown that the, um, the asymptotic form of the distribution, probability distribution, depends on the initial condition. <clears throat> the analysis of this, uh, of this functional, let me call it potential, non equilibrium potential, like uh, Robert Graham does, and uh, we have analyzed the, the evolution in time. For instance, when you look at the uh, Edward Wilkinson, you have a uh, this behavior like here, it increases from a plain solution, let's say, up to reach evolves up to, to reach a, <clears throat> uh, a plateau. 
instead when you consider that um, you're looking for the KPZ system, you find that there is a maximum and after, the, after that, the, the potential decays. And the slope, this, this, slope, this kind of characteristic appears in one dimension, two and three, and we expect that uh, in any other dimension. The slope of this decay is linear and depend, uh, depends on lambda square, it scales as lambda square. <clears throat> so we can think in a, in a very simple system like a gas in a constant gravitational field. And uh, we have analyzed such kind of system in terms of, of uh, stochastic of thermodynamics in order to gain some insight of what we can expect there. This was done in this work. And in the case of Kappa Z, the, 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 the relation with stochastic thermodynamics is very, very scarce. There are probably one of the few, or probably the first, was work was done by Barato and collaborators 10 years ago. We have produced a uh, numerical analysis with uh, my collaborator Miguel Rodriguez uh, the, in the one dimensional system. And uh, the most recent, one of the most recent ones was a uh, uh, field theoretical approach by Nigaman and Cypher. There is also um, a very short comment of Udo Cypher in one of his uh, <clears throat> review on stochastic thermodynamics. The work that I will refer is this one, is the most recent one, in which we used the variational approach and uh, together with a path integral approach in order to obtain fluctuation theorems and also the large deviation function. <clears throat> what is possible is uh, to, this, to write the probability of a forward, a given forward trajectory. This is the action of the trajectory. It's, the action is done by the, is given by the integral, time integral of the Lagrangian that has this form here. And I will not include the Jacobian of the transformation from the stochastic variables to the high variables because as indicated by Cypher and Nigeman, it uh, gives no, no further information, let's say. <clears throat> so we can look for a detailed fluctuation theorem. And for this, we need the, the ratio between this, this forward probability and the backward probability for a given trajectory is this thing here. And what we see is that uh, the entropy, the, the logarithm of this ratio, that is the, this exponent is, is directly related with the difference between the potentials of the two states, of the initial and the final state. It is possible also to, <clears throat> to obtain the Crookes-like relation or what is normally called a detailed uh, rotation theorem, writing the probability of a given production of entropy, forward entropy, and it related to uh, some algebraic, algebraic uh, steps to the backward and related to this exponential. Also, it's possible to obtain an integral fluctuation theorem that has the, the usual form and <clears throat> try to look for the <clears throat> large deviation function. This is uh, the large deviation function is defined in this way. And we can just make a connection with the, the, the things that they have just shown this, uh, this expression here that indicates the, the <clears throat> entropy product product at, uh, along a given trajectory. And uh, <clears throat> in average, what, what you, will, you will obtain is this thing here. And as T2 sub B goes to infinity or grows, let's take it to the very large limit, it will be much larger than this contribution. And what we have is that the large division function will scale with lambda square again. 
it's possible to do another thing, it's just to consider this uh, scaling and, it's, and extend this scaling that was used in one dimensional system particularly to higher dimensions, but it's uh, a reasonable assumption. But uh, this, these parameters here are correspond to the one dimensional case, but the analysis of the potential or the is time derivative that is more uh, easy to be done uh, gives re as a result uh, supplementary relations among the exponents. And this unfortunately seems to indicate a failure of this proposal. But a very recent uh, work that is, uh, is included in, uh, in their archive and is under review, uh, this one over here, <clears throat> considers that for instance, you are growing a, um, in a two-dimensional system, we are growing a surface. It uh, has um, a, um, fra a fractional character. Uh, the, the, the whole system is, uh, will not be, will not have a definite uh, dimension of two, but <clears throat> something uh, fractional. So, we are considering and analyzing this possibility in order to get uh, the possible uh, exponents for one, two, three, and more dimensions. One of the things that this work implies is that the possible, possible uh, um, a critical dimension doesn't exist. Another point is to look for the, um, the probability distribution function for the height. Professor, yes. you have five more minutes. You have five more minutes. Thank okay, you. I'm running too much. Thank you. <laughs> um, so this probability distribution function results to be the solution of this equation, this Fokker-Planck equation. And that can be, as we see here, in terms of the potential again, the derivative, the functional derivative of the potential. As, uh, as a sad comment, if lambda is zero, <clears throat> this term is not here, and the uh, focal plank equation corresponds to the Edward Wilkinson case. It has a stationary solution that corresponds to uh, an exponent of the an exponential of the uh, of the integral over space of the gradient, of the square of the gradient of the height. In the case of the <clears throat> Capizet equation, the Carla Brace Zank equation, if you put in such a distribution here, it will give you again uh, a zero solution for, uh, for the time, a zero for the time derivative, implying well, what people thought, implying that this, it is also a stationary solution in the one dimensional case and for periodic boundary conditions. What happens is that uh, I will talk again in, in, in a minute. I will come back to this point, but this is not true. Let us look at the possibility to find a solution through the considering the, the, the short time propagator of the Langevin equation or the focal plank equation. The form of the, this short time propagator is this shown here, but we can have also this up this form here. This is in detail. We have an initial pattern at an initial time and the final pattern at the final time that is just uh, differs from the initial time in a quantity tau that is very small. With this in mind, one can think what the dominant term, this is a, because it's a, of uh, totally minus one uh, order this is order one and this is order two. So it can be neglected in principle. This is the usual way when treating the short time propagators. But in this case, because as I have shown at the, at the beginning that the, the potential here has a, <clears throat> a cubic like form, this term should be included and should be kept because 
uh, it includes the four order corrections to the divergences that appears due to the cubic character of this part. If you assume an arbitrary uh, initial condition, we can try, uh, we can propagate it and repeat the propagation, exploding this, uh, this form of the, <clears throat> of the short time propagator until reaching at long time, the form of the, of the probability distribution function we are looking for. In the particular case of a plain initial condition, it will reduce to this thing here. So we see that the probability distribution function at a certain time, long time, has this structure. It depends on the potential in this way and then with this other contribution. This is a, a discrete form of the path integral to find this, uh, this distribution. In some present works, uh, several people have tried, have exploited the form of the so-called optima trajectory. This was found for the one-dimensional case in a paper by Foget, B, and Wren, and exploited, for instance, by <clears throat> uh, several people, let's say. And this optimal trajectory is nothing more than the one that minimizes the action. Also, from a point of view, a physical point of view, it should be. So, Professor incident. Rio, I think we, we have to get to, to, to wrapping it up to the conclusion in the interest okay. of the, the speakers. I okay, think I, I should finish with this. It should be uh, agree or coincide with the trajectory that uh, produces, maximizes the entropy production. This is an example, a simple example of what can be done if you consider a simple trivial interpo linear interpolation between a plane solution and a final given final solution. And uh, using this uh, path expansion method, the or zero order will, ha will have this form with the action given by this, this term here. So uh, just uh, final comments. We we obtain results of it for any dimension. We have shown that the possibility of making a st stochastic thermodynamic restriction of kpz Z by, based on the variational approach and proved several known fluctuation theorems. We have obtained the, the form of the large deviation function for entropy. And uh, in this moment, we are working on uh, some numerical test for the fluctuation theorems that we have found. Um, <clears throat> there is the possibility of obtaining critical uh, exponent through new relations. Uh, we have we have a way, in principle, to obtain the the probability distribution of height in the Capizet case. The probability distribution for the Edward Wilkinson case results to be unstable for Capizet against what is the, the crucially believed. And they we're testing some limits of our results in the one dimensional case, studying the, the large deviation function also, but not only in one, but in several dimension, and uh, expect to, to extend to a dimension the thermodynamic uncertain relations formed by Cypher and collaborators and continue with some other uh, aspects. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. And I'm sorry for the, the problems. <laughs> Thank you very much. And again, apologize to everyone because of the, the technical difficulties. At this point, I, I suggest we, we, we have to move on. And, and if you have any questions, just put it in the chat box and Professor Vio can, can answer them in writing there. So uh, with that, we are moving to our next uh, presentation. Uh, uh, Carol Prosmans from Simon Fraser University titled Finite Time Landauer Principle. And please go ahead and share your slides. Yes. Uh, a second. Okay. Can you see the slide? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. So first of all, let me uh, briefly thank the organizers for putting together this very interesting conference and for giving me the opportunity to present some of my re recent research. 
Uh, so what I will present to you today is a finite time generalization of, uh, of the classical Landers principle, something which I've been working on over the last year together with my uh, superv supervisor of my postdoc, Sean Beckhofer, and, uh, and with Yannick Erich. So before I come to the finite time Landers principle, let me just give a very short introduction on what Landers principle ex actually is. This is actually, when you'll get information erased, there is a fundamental thermodynamic cost associated with this. So for example, when you have a computational bit, it can be in state zero or state one. And suppose you initially don't know whether it is in state zero or in state one, and you want to reset to it to make sure that it is in state zero. You can show that there's a thermodynamic cost associated with this, so that you have to put in work to do this. And if, the, and if you are in a thermal environment of temperature T, the minimum amount of work that you need to put in is KT log two, and that's that's essential Landers principle in a few words. Um, so one thing about this bond is that you can only saturate the bond in the quasi-static limits. Um, so it's not possible to uh, to saturate the bonds if you want to do fast computations. So in a certain sense, this is not very practical, because of course when you have a computer, you want to do your computation very fast. And not reason why you might think that Landau's limit is not very relevant at the moment is that when you get current state-of-the-art computers, uh, the cost to raise a bit is still like a million times higher than uh, the Landau cost. But this last problem actually is relative because when you look at the efficiency of computers, this is called Kumis law, that you see over the last um, 70 years or so, there has been an increasing, uh, the, the efficiency of um, of bit erasure has continuously increased exponentially, and the cost has decreased exponentially. And in fact, you can see that the cost to raise a bit halves every um, two point five years. So when you extrapolate this, you would expect that somewhere between two thousand forty and two thousand fifty, uh, you will we will reach a state where um, where the cost to raise a bit will be exactly equal to the land or lower bound. So in that sense, it's important to start looking at fundamentally if you want to erase it very fast. What are the limits in that limit in that case? Okay, so um, when you look at classical papers of bit erasure, like the work of Landor and Bennett, and also in practical purposes, the uh, bits are generally described by microscopic variables. One can think about magnetization of a spin, or also about positional variables. And uh, then, for example, and th then this microscopic variable can be called x. And we say that the bit is in state 1 if x is larger than 0, and it's in state 0 if x is smaller than 0. So initially, if, if, if a bit the state of a bit is unknown, you, the, the probabilities are equal and, and both are one over two. Uh, and also like the bit can then be described by a microscopic probability distribution and associated potential. So here the green curve is the probability distribution, the red curve is the potential energy landscape. And what you then want to do is you want to raise the bit in such a way that at the end, the probability for x to be larger than zero is equal to, is becomes very large and the probability for x to be smaller than zero becomes very small or vice versa. And uh, so, so if you want to do full erasure, you want one of them to become epsilon and the other one, one minus epsilon. But in this study, we will allow for a finite erasure error where there's still a probability epsilon that the bit is in state one instead of state zero. Um, yeah, so anyway, so to describe the system, we decided to go for our over them for Planck equation in one dimension. Um, where you then have a diffusion coefficient and a potential energy landscape. Um, I should mention that this result can actually be extended to under dense systems or to systems in higher dimension. Uh, so it's, it's really general for classical systems. One thing that it cannot do is uh, quantum mechanical systems. So I won't have, can't answer whether it's possible to quantum mechanically, um, to whether all results holds for uh, bits that have strong quantum mechanical effects like entanglement with the environment and those kind of things. So anyway, we assume that um, the, we have full control over the potential. Um, so v, v of x and t, so one has full control of v, and, of v and x and t, and you have a certain amount of time to modify the probability distribution such that initially it's in equilibrium with the potential energy landscape, and then at the end it's in a state where it's an erased bit. Okay, so, and what we now want to do is we want to calculate the work needed to raise this bit. And of course, a very standard thermodynamic equality is that the work needed to put in an isothermal environment is equal to the free energy change plus the amount of dissipation throughout the process. Now, the non-equilibrium free energy change um, 
is easy to calculate because it only depends on the initial and the final states. And this has been done, been done before because like it's an isothermal process and you assume that you start in equilibrium. And then you can just show that this non-equilibrium free energy difference is equal to the uh, kullback leipler divergence between the initial and the final states. Now, the dissipation is, of course, much harder to calculate because this is part dependent. So once I give you the initial state and the final state of the process, you cannot just say what the dissipation was because there are several ways to get from the beginning to the end, and each of them will give a different amount of dissipation. But luckily, there has been this result in the mathematical theory of optimal transport theory by Benamou and Premier. Uh, it's in a much broader context, but when you apply it to non-equilibrium statistical mechanics, you can show that if you want to um, generally go from the initial distribution to a final distribution of an amount of time equal to t, the minimum amount of this space to do this will be given by um, this equation where f of i and f of f are the cumulative distribution of the initial and the final distribution. Um, so, of course, this is not always very easy to work with because it's the inverse of a cumulative distribution function, which generally are very ugly functions, but still it's nice that you have this lower bound, and it's also interesting to note that when you have full control over the potential energy landscape, um, then you can always saturate this bone. So this really gives you the minimum amount of dissipation. So anyway, when we, when we put these pieces together, and you can show that generally when you have an overdamped Fock Planck equation or an underdamped equation, uh, same result with holds, then you can show that the um, that the probability distribution, that that amount of work needed to go from an initial probability distribution, so initial microscopic states to a final microscopic state is given by this expression here. But of course, we are not just interested in the final microscopic state, we are interested in the state, state of the bit. So uh, the state of the bit is essentially a coarse grain quantity, uh, just in either state zero or one instead of this x, which can be minus infinity plus infinity. So what we can do is we can do a second minimization of all the final distributions that satisfy that the probability of x being smaller than zero is equal to one minus epsilon, and the probability of x larger than zero um, is equal to epsilon. So you can try to do this with uh, Lagrangian techniques, but then you run into differential equations, which even for the most simple equations cannot be solved analytically. Um, another thing which one can do is go to uh, numerical solutions. I might come back to that later, depending on how much time I will have left. But anyway, a third thing that you can do is instead of minimizing the two terms separately, you can minimize them. Sorry, instead of minimizing them together, you can minimize them separately. So you can say like the minimum amount of work is larger or equal than the minimum minimum of this of all final distribution plus minimum of this of final this all final distributions. And uh, when you do this, you get a lower bond on the amount of work needed to raise a bit. And that gives you this expression. Um, so if you have a final finite erasure error, you get first this part, which essentially is just uh, the classical Landau principle, plus an extra term, which is inversely proportional to the duration of the protocol. But then in the special case of zero erasure limit, which is, of course, is the more well-known case of fully erasing a bit, then you can show that the minimum amount of work needed to raise a bit is equal to kt log 2, uh, which is, of course, again, classical Landau's principle, plus the variance of the initial microscopic distribution divided by two times the diffusion coefficient times the duration of the protocol. Uh, so this is a very nice, very simple expression. Uh, which gives you a bond on the amount of work needed to raise a bit. But the question is, how tight is this bond, of course? Um, like when you have full control over the potential, can you always get close to this? And uh, to answer that question, it's always actually possible to get quite close because you can, what you can do is you can calculate uh, the, uh, an upper bond. So if you have full control over the protocol, you can show that it's always possible to raise a bit with less work than this amount. And once again, you have a, um, an expression for the, uh, if you have a finite erasure error. And again, when you look at this expression for zero erasure error, it's very similar, but it's just instead of divided by two times dt, it's multiplied by two. So it's only a factor for at, at most different from the lower bound. So this tells you that this uh, finite time Landau principle, if you have full control of potential, you can always get very rather close to the saturation. Okay, so uh, then I can show you a quick movie because you can also numerically calculate the optimal protocols that will give you uh, the optimal bit erasure. 
And uh, so you can look at either look at solar rays like here, and then red is the potential and green is the probability distribution. So as you can see, you start first start move, pushing the probability distribution inwards. And then at the end, you will get a probability distribution which is very similar to the initial distribution, but only in one well. And uh, as you can also see, for example, the potential also starts curving up again. So it's kind of looks very similar to the initial um, potential energy landscape near the end of the protocol. Uh, the situation is more complicated when you would look at fuzzy rays because then you immediately screw up the, pro pro the potential energy landscape and uh, you just start pushing all the probability distribution inwards without um, without taking care of much else and then uh, near the end you will see that all the probability distribution that was in state one so for x larger than zero just uh, moves to x equal to zero you don't have time to push it further which would lower the free energy distance and here it's really a dissipation like the minimizing the dissipation is here the main thing. Well, in the slow limits, you of course min try to minimize the non-equilibrium free energy difference, which if you would ignore the um, dissipation, you would just get LN2 in the optimal case. But anyway, so here you here the situation is very different than fast erasure limits. Anyway, we can also look at a numerical example. So here we plotted the work minus the Landor limit uh, for a double well potential for several heights of the barrier. And you see that um, you see that in fact you always get are between the lower and the upper bounds. And uh, the higher the well, the um, the more difficult it is to raise a bit in the slow erasure limit. But then when you log at very short though, so very fast erasure, you see that everything just converges to the um, upper bound. So this means that if you want to be erased a bit very fast, the minimum amount of work needed to do this is always almost, almost exactly equal to the variance of the initial distribution divided by two times the diffusion coefficients times the duration of the protocol, independent of the exact choice of the, of the initial distribution or the details of the system. Okay, and then uh, finally, uh, very shortly, we want to look at the uh, the comparison with experimental results that already existed because over the last years, not only in computer but also in more um, more experimental setups, which have been built with the explicit, which explicitly try to verify Landau's principle. There have been a few of these. Most of them they are based on uh, optical tweezers or feedback traps and colloidal particles. So there you have a positional variable instead of a magnetic variable, but it's really the same independent on what exactly the nature of the microscopic variable is. And they all show that you get to uh, log two. They all they focus on slow erasure because they really want to go to Landau's principle. And you, they can show that if you go very slowly, you reach the Landau bounds, but then they have a factor one over two um, one proportional to one over t with a certain prefactor. And as you can see, um, in all three experiments, it's like somewhere between five and 10, while the lower bound is 1.8. So it's like not super far in the solar erasure limit, but still it's, you can still um, go several fact, you can almost get an order of magnitude better by optimizing really the protocol, even in the slow erasure limits. Okay, so that brings me to my conclusions. Uh, so we have, uh, we have derived a general finite time correction to Landau's bounds, which gives you the minimum thermodynamic cost to raise a bit in a finite amount of time. And also, and as a nice side result, you can numerically calculate the optimal protocols for the pot potential energy landscape to erase this bit with the minimum thermodynamic cost associated with this. And then when you apply this to current state of art experimental systems, you can see that um, the our bond is roughly one order of magnitude better than uh, the then um, the optimal states the, then the current state, state of our systems and that's all I wanted to say to you today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Again, thanks for adhering to the strict time limits. And I would say there is there is time just for one question, if if there is any. And of course, if there is no question at the moment, uh, feel free to to type it out in the in the chat box to, to Carol and, and he will try to address it there. Okay, so with that, uh, we are moving on to the next presentation of the session. Uh, the speaker is uh, Professor Yuri Tarashevich from Astrakhan State University, Russia. The title of his talk is Transparent Electrodes with Rod and Ring-like Fillers, Monte Carlo Simulation and Analytical Evaluation. Is that? Uh, the stage is yours. Thank you. I think the slides are up already, so please go ahead. Hey, 
and please unmute your mic at least at this point yeah, uh, thank you thank you good go, good afternoon dear colleagues uh, can you see uh, my presentation yes and we can hear you oh okay uh tonight i would like to present you uh, two of our works on transparent electrodes with rod and ring-like fillers. Uh, the motivation of our work is that transparent electrodes are used in a range of diff diff different electronic devices such as touch screens, displays, and solar cells, and so on. Uh, there are two contradictive uh, issues. First of all, the concentration of conducting objects should be large enough to ensure the occurrence of a conducting network connecting opposite borders of the film. Uh, that is, the system has to be above the percolation threshold. Simultaneously, the connect, uh, concentration should be small enough to ensure high transparency of this film. The goal is to predict uh, the optimal concentration of conductive fillers. We try to uh, elaborate uh, a tool to predict the optimal concentration of conductive fillers uh, on the transparent substrate. In our simulation, objects are randomly placed onto a substrate. As a rule, we use a square domain uh, L to L with periodic boundary conditions. And we uh, deposit uh, the object with desired number density N. Uh, objects may be of different sizes. That is, they may, uh, the objects may obey size distribution as a, uh, in real systems. Then the system transforms into a corresponding random graph, which is treated as a random resistor network. And the electrical conductivity of such the RRN is calculated using Kirchhoff's law uh, and Ohm's law. There are two very different cases. First of all, uh, unwelded wires. In this case, the junction uh, resistance dominates over the wire resistance. Uh, moreover, there are welded wires. Welding uh, can be produced, produced with different ways. Uh, that is a pure technical problem. Uh, it is solved in many ways. The junction resistance and the wire resistance are of the same order. Uh, I would like to start with rod-like fillers. Uh, the simplest way uh, is to present uh, a filler as a, a disc rectangle. Uh, that is, we exclude any effects of waveness or curveness. Uh, we suppose that uh, fillers uh, are straight. Uh, we can consider a hard core and a soft shell. Uh, when two of the wires or rods intersect, uh, intersect each other, uh, we have a junction with a conductivity uh, GJ. Moreover, each segment of uh, our road has 
uh, conductivity. Moreover, if two uh, of rods don't intersect each other, uh, but they uh, the shells overlap each other, there are a, a tunneling effect between uh, these uh, rods. The corresponding uh, conductivity is exponential uh, indeed. This scheme represents uh, the simplest case when we have only three roads, uh, two intersecting roads, and two uh, and one uh, non-intersecting road. Uh, we can uh, see each segment and each junction in our sheen, uh, this segment uh, via conductivity, junction between two rods, this conductivity, uh, between points two and four, this conductivity, and uh, so on. Uh, between uh, points five and uh, seven, we have this tunneling junction. Okay. Uh, to simplify our simulations, we use uh, so-called cutoff distance. Uh, it means that we uh, omit uh, any tunneling effect if uh, the distance between two roads is large enough. In our formula, uh, delta uh, ij means the shortest distance between uh, E and uh, G squares. G uh, O is the conductivity of the, the of the junction between the two wires. Uh, xi is the tunneling decay length. Uh, it depends on the electronic potential bar barrier between the two wires. Uh, it's very surprising, but in the simplest case, when um, the density of uh, when the number density of rods is very small, uh, the uh, contribution of uh, tunnel uh, conductivity can be estimated uh, analytically. Uh, for very sparse systems, when any intersections of roads are very unlikely, the uh, total contribution of all uh, tunneling contacts to the electric conductivity is given by, by this formula. And the technical details uh, can be found in our recently published work. We can see uh, the references here. And now uh, some numerical results. Uh, in this case, we have uh, unwelded wires. It means uh, the conductivity of wires is much greater than the conductivity of uh, junctions. Uh, we can see how the total conductivity depends on the uh, number of uh, rods uh, per unit area. Another case uh, corresponds to welded wires. And uh, at last, uh, welded wires and a significant tunneling. In fact, we can compare to uh, we can compare uh, 
com compare these two uh, figures and we can see that uh, tunneling is, uh, is, is significant only uh, near the percolation threshold. It's quite expectable. Another, uh, another uh, possibility corresponds to ring-like fillers. Uh, left figure uh, demonstrates the real system with uh, um, silver uh, rings. Uh, and uh, the right figure demonstrates uh, our simulation. We produce a randomly deposited rings. Uh, red rings correspond to a percolation cluster. This cluster connects both uh, pair of opposite borders. That is, uh, the conductivity is possible in both directions. Uh, this case is very attractive because uh, there are no dead ends. Uh, nevertheless, uh, there are some rings uh, these rings cannot uh, carry a current most likely, nevertheless, uh, they have uh, has negative effect on uh, transparency. Uh, in this case, some analytical results are also possible. For instance, uh, we can find the probability density function uh, of the arc distribution, uh, distribution. Indeed, uh, when two or three or more uh, circles intersect each other, there are arcs of different sizes. The arc size distribution is uh, described by, by exponential distribution. Uh, this simple result uh, allows uh, to uh, estimate uh, electrical conductivity of such the system. Uh, for, dense uh, for dense systems, the sheet conductance can be written as uh, this equation. In this equation, A is the cross-sectional areas of the ring forming wires, and C is the percolation threshold uh, and star is the relative uh, number density and uh, sigma is the electrical conductivity of wires. Uh, we have simulated two uh, cases. In the first one, uh, films were produced of equal size rings. In the second case, the films were with rings of different radio. In both cases, uh, the electrical conductivity depends uh, on the number density linearly, uh, accordingly to uh, theoretical predictions. Uh, technical details can be found in this publication. Moreover, uh, these two works are only a small part of our contribution in electrical, uh, in simulation of the electrical conductivity of um, transparent electrodes. We can uh, find some technical details and additional information in our uh, articles published during uh, last uh, three or, or four years. Uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, any questions? Thank you very much, Professor Tarashevich. Uh, any question, for the speaker?
I have one, one question. Very nice talk. Uh, uh, my question is, is that when you, you looked at basically conductivity resistance issues for this random network that you created on a substrate, very, very interesting uh, patterns. Uh, have you thought about or, or planning to work on when you're not only just looking at DC uh, conductivity and resistance, but you would consider uh, you know, LC elements thrown down and, and, and looking at resonances, uh, frequency distributions, anything that you can get out of there as far as the, you know, the analogous dynamic response and of course dealing with the complex variables in that case. Yes, you are quite right. Uh, this topic is extremely important and we are going to include in our consideration both uh, uh, inductive and uh, capacity, uh, um, inductivity and ca capacity, um, uh, but uh, it uh, it uh, we we need much more uh, powerful uh, computer tools because even in this simplest case we. Uh, produce very large matrices. Uh, fortunately, these matrices are very sparse, uh, but they are huge. If you introduce new elements, uh, their matrices will be much huge. It's a problem. It's a technical problem, but we hope we will be able to resolve this problem. Thank you. I really like the aspect that it was still a very clean framework, mathematically tractable, but, but it, it had some, some practical details taken care of, like uh, welding, the junctions, the tunneling. There are a lot of works in resistor networks, various random patterns, but, but that aspect, which makes it, makes it also practical, is, is, is non-trivial. So I, I, I really enjoyed that part of the talk, that it, it, it mentioned how to take care of junctions, welding, tunneling, and, 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 and those things. So, Okay, so thank you. Um, if, if no more questions, then thanks the speaker again. And I would uh, go ahead and introduce the, uh, the last uh, speaker of the session, invited the talk by Professor Claudius Gross from uh, Goethe University, Frankfurt, Germany, titled Statistical Physics of Envy. Okay, uh, thank you very much for the <clears throat> introduction and for the invitation to <clears throat> join and to talk at the MECO conference, which I um, enjoy it very much. So um, I will go very slowly since this is a, a subject which uh, may be new to quite a few of the audience. And uh, I will start uh, by saying what I'm going to do. So which will be the result. And uh, then I will go step by step explaining how we arrived to this result. <clears throat> and the result will be that we have in an artificial society of agents, or maybe also in the human society, three components, namely the freedom of choice to have different, uh, to select different possibilities. For example, a job, you have different jobs you can select and depending what kind of job you select, you get different incomes. And if you have in, uh, competition, so if two people uh, select the same options, uh, there will be less for everybody. <laughs> and if there's a desire, to compare yourself with other people. And that is called envy. And you have these three components on a very general ground. Uh, the result will be that you will have a social stratification stat uh, um, transition. So the society will split, split up into social classes. And I will also make use a little bit of a physics analogy, namely, and I will explain that of course, step by step, that our, the game theory approach for a society of agents with many options uh, can be mapped <coughs> really one-to-one -to, -one to a classical many-body uh, problem. And please uh, interrupt me at any time when you have questions. So uh, before I go into details, uh, let me also say, uh, how do we find uh, social classes? So if we have something like uh, rewards or income, so that is what uh, uh, somebody gets and we order the incomes uh, depending uh, from lower to upper. So we get a band 
to every agent, every person of the society has in the end some reward. And if this is a continuous uh, line, there's one band in physics language, we say, well, overall, there may be richer people and poorer people, but overall, it's one class. But if this splits into two uh, bands, uh, then we will speak about two classes. This is here the red one, the upper class, and the lower class here, <coughs> which is split by a gap, by, uh, which is uh, uh, <coughs> separated by a gap. Uh, you also could look at the spectral density and the black curve, it's a continuous one, it's a little bit broadened here, and the red curve, we have a spectral gap. <coughs> so we will use this very simple definition of social classes. If there's an income gap, we have uh, social classes. If there's no income gap, we don't have. So since I'm going to talk about game theory and for the first uh, uh, time here in this conference, I will do a very simple introduction uh, what kind of game theory I'm dealing with. <coughs> And now many of you may know games like the prisoner's dilemmas where two people have two uh, options and depending what the other person does, you get uh, a bigger or smaller reward. Uh, we will use a different kind of game which is used a lot in animal conflict theory. I will explain that it's called all pay auctions. It's a very simple game. <laughs> you uh, put down your investment, your stake, which is something between real, something between zero and infinity, or some money you put down. And from everybody who, uh, who joins the competition, uh, the person who has the highest investment, the highest bid, wins the jackpot, we, and everybody else gets nothing. Now it's called all pay auction because everybody pays. That means you don't get a refund. So it's not an auction like for an, for an uh, picture for a Van Gogh picture where if you don't get it you get your money back and that is the, re the reason is because you're modeling animal conflicts consider two animals they both want to have the same territory they invest time and energy they fight so they have an investment and in the end one of the animals gets the territory gets the prize but the investment of the other animal of the losing animal it still has it it doesn't get a refund on the time and the energy so you invest and if you lose your investment is not refunded. So that is uh, a typical, a very basic model for our animal conflicts. <clears throat> now, a uh, central quantity is a payoff, namely what you get if you have a certain uh, investment, which is called X. So it's very simple, uh, V minus X if you're winning and minus X if you're losing. And uh, the object of desire, which we want to uh, study, is the strategy. The strategy is not how much you invest, but the strategy is the probability to invest X. So the strategy is the probability distribution function. And they are pure strategy. When you invest every time exactly the same amount, let's say X zero, then your strategy is a delta function. And if your strategy is not a delta function, it's called a mixed strategy. So you do depend uh, you uh, uh, have different uh, investments which you uh, which you use okay so the central quantity which is of uh, uh, interest here is the notion of uh, an evolutionary stable strategy uh, the idea is you have some strategy you get an uh, payoff an average payoff uh, which determines your fitness. The more you get, the higher your fitness. And uh, you have a loop then, you're trying to improve your strategy such that your fitness is maximized. And once you have self-consistency, uh, you are uh, evolutionarily stable. That's a concept by uh, Smith from 74. Um, now, uh, we define the support of a strategy uh, all the investments for which you have a finer probability to bid. So if the, invest, the probability to bid X is zero, you're not inside the report. And now uh, it's easy to see that the payoff is constant on the support because uh, independent of what you bid X, you must get the same payoff because if you would get lower, you wouldn't do this bid. If you would get more, you invest more probability into that bid. So if you have an evolutionary stable strategy, your payoff is constant uh, on the support. 
now of course lower if for x not part sorry not part of the support there's an error and lower for x not part of the support now let's say we have a society of agents all playing the evolutionary stable strategy then you invest m against evolutionary stable strategy what you get well for the alpha models with all pay auctions you always uh, lose uh, minus m because that's your uh, investment and you win if the other person is bidding something lower so that's the uh, uh, probability to that the other person bids something lower it's an integral p of x dx from zero to m and now if you say you're also playing evolutionary stable strategy uh, this must be a constant so this is uh, because otherwise you wouldn't be evolutionary stable now that's uh, very simple uh, has a very simple solution so if you if this one is constant well you just take the derivative respect to m and we take the derivative we get here v p upon m, upon of m equals one and so we get this very very simple uh, 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 result that the strategy is constant one over v now this is uh, something uh, somehow you could think oh that's trivial we, we proved that in two lines and it is trivial but it's also very deep because it tells you that variable behavior may be evolutionary optimal so if you see animals which change their behavior it's not necessarily randomness it may be the optimal strategy to behave uh, to change behavior and that is of course not also true for animals also for humans in conflict situation uh, it's a generic the case always doing the same is not optimal but variable behavior may be uh, evolutionary optimal and it may be for example uh, an explanation why humans have different characters and every depending on your character you're doing something else so this this behavior can either be from day to day or it could be genetically encoded so you're part of the population uh, uh, doing something else than the other one so this variable behavior might either be on a personal level or on a genetic level so very simple calculation but it's a pretty uh, far-reaching result so that was my introduction to a game theory. Now I'm coming to the three components uh, I would need for my society of agents and uh, choice, competition, and envy. I will talk about envy a lot, a little bit later on. Let us focus first on the two uh, components. So we have a society of agents, many agents, uh, alpha equals one to M, M can be 100,000 or just 10. And you have many options, uh, so many things you can do, also a large number. And so for every agent, we have a strategy, uh, PI of alpha, and that is uh, the probability uh, to play options I. Now, since we have so many options, uh, we want to have them continuously on a real axis. We call the real values qualities QI, and then we have a bare utility function uh, V of QI. So if the agent is alone, if there's nobody else in the world, that is what you get. So playing this option, you get this. Playing this one is, you're playing this. This is the utility, that's the choice. You have different possibilities, and depending what you do, you get something else. Now here's an example of an inverse parabola, but you could take anything else, it doesn't really matter. And the second uh, component is competition. If two agents uh, uh, use, wants to do the same, here, for example, uh, they don't get the same, they get something less uh, because if uh, there's, let's say, two people apply for the same job, well, then maybe the, the uh, salary they get offered is a little bit less. Now, there's a very simple physics analogy for this one. In this analogy, agents are those classical particles. The QI is a state they can occupy. Uh, minus V is the confining potential because in physics, we want to minimize energy. In game theory, we want to maximize reward. And minus kappa is just the Coulomb repulsion. So if two agents occupy the same state, there's a Coulomb uh, repulsion, and uh, you have a higher energy. So in this, for this part, you really just have the society of competing agents is just uh, classical agents, uh, classical particles in a confining potential. 
But let me just note that in most uh, game theoretical strategies, something similar is there, maybe not exactly in this form. You have choice, you have different possibilities, and you have competition in the, the one form or the other one, but these two components are very far reaching. Now, <clears throat> Uh, let us formulate that into terms of um, um, payoff function. So the payoff an agent receives is then the utility when nobody else is there, uh, minus uh, the competition. And the competition is proportional to the probability that somebody else. Now, in this approximation, uh, we don't put here density operator, but we, we just sum over the probability that the uh, some other agents place this, uh, uh, these options, once also do the same option. So in the physics analogy, these are the energy level. And of course, we are doing here not quantum mechanics, but we have the occupation uh, probability to occupy a certain state, but we're not doing quantum mechanics, and quantum mechanics would be the square of the wave function. Uh, let me note that this model has, uh, it's pretty simple in the sense it's a mean field model because the sum uh, can be written in this way. You can sum over all agents and subtract your own probability. And that is, of course, just uh, the number of agents times the uh, mean uh, strategy. Of course, this is not a mean field coupling, which is a scalar coupling, but in a, but in a, uh, like in a generalized Hartree Fock approximation, uh, you have a state or space dependent uh, molecular field. Now that's all very simple, but we have to take a little bit of time to visualize the system because we want, in the next step, we want to introduce envy. So of course, putting, putting uh, agents into uh, confining potential is uh, just very simple, but what we have want to plot is not just the uh, final energy, for example, here or here, the so final reward, but the full payoff function. And we have many payoff functions and many agents. We want to plot them all on the same uh, on the same diagram. So here we have 100 agents, 100 options, and here I showed us two of them. Now this, for example, is an agent uh, playing in options where nobody else is uh, playing, so you get the bare utility. But if this one, the red one, plays something else, it's, it's, you don't really see it's below the blue one. While somebody else is playing, you get the utility minus uh, minus uh, the Coulomb repulsion. And here, if you would play it here, well, you get the utilities minus two times uh, the competition because two agents are selecting these options. So uh, since it's overcrowding, I don't put the symbols. So now I plotted all the 100 utility functions. And then I have here 70 agents uh, just playing uh, these options, uh, these options, and there are always two agents uh, playing the same options. So that's why you get a reduced utility. And here there are only uh, one agent per option, so singly occupied in physics terms, uh, and we have a total of 30 agents. So this is just uh, for these kind of parameters. Now, this is uh, for the basic model, choice and competition. And now we'd like to go to our main uh, object, namely envy. So what is envy? The envy uh, we define here as a desire to compare oneself to somebody else. Now envy in uh, normal societies is a slightly negative term, uh, but there's actually no neutral term for this desire to comp compare oneself. For example, this blue, this blue man here, this blue figure, could be happily, could be perfectly happy with a loan, but seeing somebody else uh, with a big uh, stack of gold, uh, he might become envy. So uh, the, to be happy or not to be happy depends not only what you have, but also relatively to other people. And that is very well known in economics. There's a large branch of uh, what is called relative income theory. So people uh, care how much they make how much money they make with respect to others. And for example, the most maybe <clears throat> simplest way to see that envy or the desire to compare yourself is relevant in our societies is that we all more or less agree <clears throat> that it's good to define poverty not in absolute term, but in relative term. So what is uh, 
somebody who, uh, who has, uh, let's say, uh, 300 euros, maybe was not poor 40 years ago, but it's poor nowadays because we define it in relative terms. And that is uh, the basis of our theory. Now we want to formulate that in game theoretical uh, concept. <clears throat> uh, for that, um, we define the average uh, payoff. The average payoff is just the expectation value of the utility. So that's your strategy, the probability to play the option I uh, times the uh, uh, payoff, what you get when you're playing it, so it's just the average, and we call it here a reward. So that's what you get in the end of the day, uh, the average payoff. And uh, ABA is a mean reward of the whole population. <clears throat> and we take here a very simple uh, uh, definition of envy, namely that you're happy um, if your reward, so what you get is larger than what the mean reward of the society, and unhappy if what you get is slow um, smaller than the mean reward. Now, what you're trying to do if you're happy, well, <clears throat> you're obviously doing fine. So you're trying to enforce your current strategy because it seems that your strategy is good. So you're trying to, to enforce it. But if you're unhappy, well, maybe it's better to do something else. So you try to change your current strategy. <clears throat> so that is uh, our basic definition of envy. And now how do we formulate that? It will be... Um, this term here, the last term. Now, let me, so this is the overall utility function. We call that the shopping travel model, shopping travel model, because it's like, also you go to a shop, you buy something. If two people buy the same thing, while well, you have a problem, you get a penalty, which is here the cover term. And you have envy if you go out and you thought you have maybe a perfectly nice jacket, when you somebody else with another jacket, which is nicer, maybe you're not happy anymore what you bought. <clears throat> so we have the log term. Here is the ratio of what you get, your reward, with respect to the mean reward. Uh, if you get more, the log term is positive. If you get less, the log term is negative. <clears throat> Epsilon is the strength of the envy, the coupling constant. <clears throat> and a P alpha QI, your current strategy. Now, if you are happy, <clears throat> uh, you are Reward, your, your utility increases if you uh, increases your current strategy, because this is a positive term here. So if this is a positive term, you want also to increase your strategy because then you get more. If this is a negative term, you want to decrease your current strategy because it's a penalty. So that is why this is the uh, <clears throat> formula for the envy which we are going to use. Now there's uh, something uh, of course uh, pretty interesting, namely the mean reward is the expectation value of your uh, utility, of your payoff function, and it's also here. That means we have a self-consistency problem because the rewards appears on the left-hand side, it's a result on the right-hand side. It's like uh, in many of our series of phase transition in physics. Uh, and uh, it's also interesting to see that we have another mean field coupling and this will actually allow us to have a complete analytic solution for the class separated state, which is pretty interesting uh, and has very interesting properties. So let me show for a small system what happens. We can do arbitrary large system, but in order to show, we take here a small system. So we have 20 agents and 20 options. Um, here on the left-hand side, we have low envy, uh, 0.3, uh, 0.5, and we here we have a little bit higher NV, uh, 0.7. So what is shown here is the uh, rewards, and here the strategies are shown. Okay, let's first come in here. Uh, so what we see, we still have, uh, uh, even so we have a finite NV, now we have still agents playing pure strategies, the red and the blue, either singly occupied or doubly occupied, but we have some mixed strategies uh, starting to appear, which is also seen here. The pure strategies go to one, the probability one, and the mixed strategies, of course, don't go to one because the sum of probabilities adds to one. 
Now, if we uh, uh, increase and we just a little bit to 0.7, we have a complete reorganization of the spectrum. Uh, we have still uh, pure strategies. These are the, the red ones. But then we have just one mixed strategy, which is shown here. That is the reward of the mixed strategy. And uh, everybody else, so apart from these seven people playing a few strategies, but everybody else plays exactly the same mixed strategy. And uh, there are two constant rewards. So you have a full separation of classes, for upper class and lower class. And these dashed line are actually not just guide to the line, but a theory result. So we can exactly calculate uh, these uh, values. And so there are quite a few things which are uh, 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 astonishing here. We have a uh, changing envy. We have a strict class separation, not just two bands, but uh, these are flat bands in physics terms. Everybody in the upper class has the same reward. Everybody in the lower class has the same reward. Uh, even so, they're playing different strategies in the upper class, and here they're playing different, they have one strategy in the lower class. So the lower class plays a mixed strategy. We call that here forced cooperation because it's cooperation because they're trying to avoid each other, but not because they really want, because uh, that is uh, energetically favorable. And this is a class stratified state with a large gap. Now, there are quite a few uh, interesting properties here. Uh, we want to uh, uh, examine these properties. This is, for example, for a little bit larger system, 100 agents and 100 options. Uh, the uh, um, uh, competition is still uh, 0.3. We can also change that. And uh, we see the same picture for the small system. The whole, uh, the whole uh, model is size consistent. We have plenty of agents playing in the middle uh, few options. Uh, and there are two agents per options. Here, the agents playing one option. There's one agent per options. Some uh, mixed strategies appear here at the boundaries. Uh, but if we're increasing and we, we get a completely uh, class stratified state, in this case, we have 20 upper class agents and 80 lower class agents playing exactly all doing the same. So this is like, uh, let's say, speaking colloquially, if you're part of the lower class, you're part of the masses, everybody's doing the same. Uh, if you're part of the upper class, everybody's doing something differently. Now, how can we uh, explain that? We will explain that uh, shortly. But first, uh, let me uh, uh, point out another uh, uh, consequence. Now, envy, you can uh, consider to be a psychological term. You can say, oh, what really matters is money, the real money, the number of euros I get in the end of the day. So the monetary income, income is the reward minus the envy term. You say, oh, maybe I have just a gap in the reward, but I don't have a gap in the income because the envy is a psychological term. So I can just calculate that. So that's the envy term is like this one, and just calculate the difference. And here I've plotted two spectrum. This is the reward spectrum, and that is the spectrum of uh, monetary incomes for the same system, which I showed you before. So it's exactly the system here, which I showed you before, with exactly the same parameter. And now for small envy, 0.4, I have one band. Of course, there are people who are in the monetary income. They are earning less and people who are earning more. But there's one continuous uh, class. But uh, after the phase transition, I have two flat band separated classes. That is true both for the reward here and for the income. Actually, the interesting result here is for the income, Actually, uh, this is not a coincidence. It doesn't have to be all the time. Everybody loses because also the, the people earning uh, more at the beginning, increasing envy reduces their income, the monetary income. And for the people at the bottom, of course, they also do. So it's not that the society at all will uh, benefit, but envy is destructive for the society, uh, overall society. Now, we can look at this as a function of envy. 
you can look at for different kappa. So here's the case kappa 0.3. And uh, we can uh, track what's happening as a function of the NV strength. So if there's no NV, we only have pure strategies. Uh, the number of pure strategies going down, this NV, and the number of mixed strategies here goes up. And then it goes down. And so what happens actually is the transition we have, it's a pretty interesting transition. It's a, a strategy merging transition because you have many mixed strategies just before the transition. They all merge into one strategy uh, uh, in the class 25 uh, state. Now there is a transition region. Uh, the nature of the transition is not fully uh, yet clear, but it looks like the transition is first order. So I have a finite uh, region of transition with hysteresis. That means starting from around the initial condition, doing the numerical simulation in this transition region, I get either to the uh, 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 weak NV or to the uh, large NV state, the fourth cooperation of class stratified. And doing it many times, uh, then since we have an averaging uh, here, the number of the average number of mixed strategies goes down slowly, but this is a, a hist hysteric uh, uh, transition. Uh, pretty interesting is also that the number of, um, of pure strategy is going, uh, dropping continuously. <clears throat> so, and actually for a finite system, it's dropping continuously to a finite number one or two. So here we have the upper class, we have here 20 upper class uh, agents. This is for 0.8. But if I increase NV, this number 20 goes down, goes down, and you have only one or two left. That can be called a monarchy stay because we just have monarchy, maybe one or two uh, at the top, and everybody has a button uh, in the lower class. So we have a microscopic lower class and an intensive uh, uh, upper class. And now you might uh, consider where the communism would not be stable, namely that the number of upper class agents goes to zero and everybody is playing the same mixed strategies. So that would be called communism. Everybody's doing the same. Everybody's getting the same. There's no difference between any, everybody. But it turns out uh, there's not yet an analytic uh, proof, but it turns out uh, at least numerically that communism is never stable and it's unstable against monarchy. So NV uh, destabilizes uh, communism uh, and uh, if you have a large NV, you go to a monarchy state. Uh, one can calculate, of course, the full phase diagram um, by looking at different uh, values of the competition and different values of the NV. And uh, 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 the interesting point is, is everything is here of order of unity. So you don't get need gigantic N values of NV or something else, but just of your order of unity does your transition. So what is shown here is both a numerical result and theory, a very rough theory approximation, which comes from a large NV expansion. Here I have for a small density. So uh, there are two options per one agents. Here is a larger density of agents. So the larger density of agents, of course, and the stronger the competition, uh, the less envy you need. So uh, if you have a lot of competition, small envy already does the job to splitify. If you have less competition and uh, very few uh, agents, pair options, you need a larger value of your envy. Uh, okay, so one can, uh, develop a theory for the class stratified state. And one can uh, derive an analytic formula for the rewards of the lower and the upper class. For that, we define how many agents are there in the lower class or in the upper class in percentage, that's a fraction of agents. And what you find, this expression here, it's an exact expression, there's no approximation here, uh, that uh, the lower class and the upper, the same, the similar formula for the upper class rewards 
depends only on the fraction of agents in the classes and on the coupling constant kappa and epsilon, but not on the underlying utility to the black water. So if you're alone, what you're getting is a utility, that's your confining potential. So what you find is a pro part of the property of, of the state, so the state depends only on the coupling constant, but not on the confining potential. Now that's of course not the same universal universality we have in phase transition, but it's a kind of independency on the microscopic. So in this sense, it is some universal quantity, by the way, which means that politically a class stratified state is more difficult to control because if you control what people uh, earn by taxes, well, you cannot really uh, uh, control the class stratified state directly because it doesn't enter here. Now, one can prove that. Um, I think because of time, I won't go out through the proof. The proof is not very difficult. It is conceptually uh, demanding, but uh, equation-wise, it's very simple. But uh, let me just uh, uh, tell how you would prove it. Now, this is an even smaller system here for illustration. Uh, 10 size, sides, so 10 uh, options, uh, and this uh, 10 agents. So we have only 10, so why are these are the options. This is their utility. And uh, here you have two upper class and eight lower class uh, agents. And we have two types of options, options which are played by upper class agents, QU, and options which are not played by upper class agents, Q not U. And now uh, I have two utility functions for the lower and the upper class, and I have two kinds of uh, options. So I have four equations. So what I have to do, I have to compare these four equations uh, uh, for these two possibilities. Um, and doing that, um, uh, maybe I just give you a hint for the first two equations, I will then skip the rest. Let's take some condition for uh, qualities not played by an upper class. Now for the lower class, that's a lower class payoff, since the lower class has a constant payoff because of a mixed strategy, uh, the utility is uh, uh, the reward. That is trivial because mixed strategy have constant uh, payoff. And now, what is it? Now, well, you have your bare utility, this one. Now you're playing, since you are from the lower class, you are playing against ML, so the number of agents in the lower class minus one other lower class agents which have the probability PL of Q of minus U to uh, play these options. And then you have your NV term. Now there's no upper class coming in because the upper class doesn't play this option. So there's nothing coming in here. Now, but the, I can still write down the utility for the upper class as exactly the same option. Now that's very simple. There's no NV term because the NV term is proportional to the probability and the upper class doesn't play this option. So the probability is zero. And now you're playing against the entire lower class. So the term ML here instead of ML minus one. Now you can put these two together because this term and this term also occurs here and here. This drops out, putting that together, you get this equation. So namely, uh, uh, a difference between the uh, lower class uh, reward and the upper class uh, payoff. Now, we didn't yet prove, so what one has to prove, the first thing one has to prove is that this one is exactly the same. Here you see the red and the green are the same. So one has to prove in the first one that these two are actually the same. But we didn't yet prove that. We only proved that this relation. And, uh, Maybe I'm just doing that as the last uh, thing here. Uh, uh, we have the condition for the evolutionary stable strategy that this inequality is because if you're playing something else against a different strategy, you have to have a lower payoff. And so this is the same equation we just had here, which we just derived, but we uh, re did rewrite it. So this is the same equation we just derived. So this one has to be. Uh, Positive. This is any positive because of the probability. Now this one for the lower class, it's negative. Now that means if I increase envy, 
this term becomes more negative and more negative, and it would make everything negative, but it cannot be because the right hand side has to be positive. That means uh, there's a lock in condition. That means in the class stratified state, if this one becomes large enough, this one has to vanish. That means that this one has to become zero because it cannot become uh, negative. So uh, using this argument, you prove that actually the upper class uh, payoff is the same uh, uh, for, uh, for, um, for qualities they don't play, it's the same as the utility of uh, the reward of the, of the lower class. Now you see the equations are very simple, but the arguments, you have to think a little about that. And um, I think I will skip the other equations. You can do that the same, uh, you, you, you do that, okay, maybe this one I can still do. Since this one is zero here, uh, this part here is zero, you get this universal relation between the re mean reward and the reward of the lower class. You can uh, then uh, use the uh, definition of the class uh, fractions, and then you do the conditions for the uh, qualities played by the upper class. You're doing two of these conditions. Uh, you can prove that the upper class has a constant reward and essentially then you can uh, calculate and in the end if you put everything together you get to these two uh, formulas which I uh, showed to you before. And so this is pretty, let me recap that, <coughs> how this proof goes. Um, so uh, you're doing, going in two steps you're looking at the conditioned at these kind of options and you prove that the red and the blue uh, uh, payoff function coincide uh, because of the lock-in condition. And uh, then you're looking at these kind of uh, options which are played by upper class. And then you can prove that all uh, upper class agents have exactly the same uh, reward, which is pretty interesting because of course, because the bare utility is different. And you also see that there are some uh, gaps in here. It doesn't matter that there are gaps, so they don't have to do always the optimal here, because in the end, uh, they can do whatever they want. So they have kind of freedom of choice. Whatever they play, uh, they could also play something here. In the end, the lower class adapts their own uh, probability distribution function. Uh, you see that here. Let me just put that here. Oops, uh, one sees that here, the lower class adapts uh, its own strategy, uh, whether there's an upper class agents playing or not. So the lower class, in the end, the interaction between the upper and the lower class is responsible that we have a flat band here also for the upper class. Okay, let me come uh, to the conclusions. Um, <clears throat> so, we started here with a game a theoretical uh, model uh, and uh, uh, there's a, a close uh, analogy to classical particles and I think actually you can use, use this uh, two ways. You may could use a classical model of statistical physics, uh, recast into a game theoretical model and use the game theoretical concepts uh, to see whether you can find another solution. <clears throat> now, uh, these, um, we believe that these results which we get are pretty universal. So if, of course, you have a very specific model, but if you have our three components, choice, competition, and envy, uh, we believe the same result will hold. Now, in our case, uh, we have a collapse of mixed strategies. <clears throat> so in certain sense, you can see the transition, the cluster uh, separation transition as a Bose condensation, of course, with classical particles, there's no coherence, there's nothing like a condensate, there's no wave function, but it's somehow uh, as close as you can get to a Bose condensation in, this, in, in the sense you have many different strategies, so many different probability distribution function, which collapse into one single distribution function, namely the strategy of the lower class. Of course, it's nothing coherent here, but it's as close as you get to a Bose condensation uh, for a classical system. 
And in the end, well, the result is that uh, if you increase MB, society splits. And I think that was my time and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for the, for the nice presentation. In fact, you even had a bit more time. So uh, I thought I had 40 minutes. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you're right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was, <laughs> yeah, yes. Thank you very much. Yeah. So you, you had me out, great deal. So, so uh, uh, any, any questions for uh, before finishing the session? In the box or chat box or in live, uh, I, I might I might have one question. Uh, I, I probably missed it at, at some early point when the whole game setup was was mentioned. So so the the rules of the games involve uh, agents uh, interacting pairwise, or or in some global mean field uh, venue. Well, it is. Um, um, um... It is uh, via the uh, probability okay. to uh, to so in certain sense you can say it's it's uh, sorry it is I should make a share screen again it is pairwise because uh, uh, it is always the probability to uh, well not pairwise it's everybody with everybody like Got it. Okay. Uh, but, but it's summing up the pairwise interaction. Okay. Uh, okay. Because it's a, over the, it's defined directly in the probability distribution function here. So that is a one agent alpha interacting with agent beta pairwise in some sense. Yeah. yeah so basically, my my uh, you know my, my, my question was along the line was that is the is the setup can be modified such that the agents are are influenced by what they see around them. So whether it's some some group of people who, 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 who influence others through their strategy, or maybe their strategy becomes visible, then they start copying the strategy and then ultimately defeats the purpose of winning. So is, is there room for that kind of generalization in the, in the, in, in, you know, yeah, in the room? So, so what is done here, it is in terms of the strategy directly, uh, what you do, what you would do then is to do an uh, uh, agent-based simulation so we do a, like a Monte Carlo simulation of um, uh, individual agents. So here we work directly with the strategy of the agents. They're all different. So every agent has a different strategies. Okay. So it's not mean field. So every as because otherwise they wouldn't do something else. So every agent is doing something else here. <clears throat> but we work directly with the strategies. So what you can offer, of course, do is you work uh, time averaging in the sense an agent at a certain time is in a certain option and then the next time it hops to a different option like you would do within a classical system you're hopping from one state to another one thank you thank you for explaining it to me okay okay anyone with the camera on wants to ask a question i have a question one more please so uh, my question uh, here, Claudius, would be that uh, after my experience, usually the game theoretical approach is very suitable for smaller system sizes. So when you go to large systems, let's say you want to generalize your results to a town or a, or a society, then the problem becomes usually not tackled by game theoretical approach and then some mean field, it's much more suitable. So uh, I think this, what you presented, it's, it's really suitable for a smaller uh, system size, like let's say a class or a class in a, in a high school or, or a smaller friendship companion rather than, than let's generalize it to a society. Well, maybe um, well, that uh, could easily be, but <laughs> let's say from a theoretical point of view, what you can do with the size consistent here, so you can take the thermodynamic limit uh, if the number of the density of agents is constant. So agents per si the particles per side or agents per options. If this density is uh, let's say one, one point two, if that is fine, is constant, you can take the thermodynamic limit, size consistent model. 
so in this sense, it's valid for uh, any number, but in reality, it may be more suitable that for smaller systems that could of course be. Yeah, so, so uh, I was referring definitely for reality and not for that mm -hmm. you are able or not to do this for big system sizes. So. Yeah.